It was the early to mid 90s when I first started experimenting with uh, 3D. Back then pretty much everything was hard to do. Modeling, texturing, rendering, it was all a big chore. If you want to create something more than a grid floor and some shiny spheres, you had to put quite a bit of effort. And if we move even further back to the 80s, things were even worse. You had to basically program everything yourself. So when I see the tools we have available nowadays, I can't help but smile. Let's take as an example creating a realistic material. Back then, that would mean slapping a low resolution image onto an object, maybe creating a bump map out of it, and calling it done. Even big movie productions used that method. For instance, in Toy Story, they used tileable textures, none of which exceeded 512 pixels in size. Fast forward to today, and we can now create beautiful high resolution materials with minimum effort. We can take a simple picture with our phone, and with some simple processing, get not just a diffuse map, but also an automatically created normal roughness and height map, just from a single photograph. It's a straightforward process, and that's what we'll cover in this video. Let's go! There are several different programs that allow us to do this sort of thing, but the software we're going to use today is Adobe Substance Sampler. It's an easy to use program and it has the added bonus of working seamlessly with Substance Designer. So if we want to bring even more detail and flexibility to our materials, we can do so. But in this video, we'll just focus on Sampler. Let's start with the base of our material. This is a photo I took with my iPhone as I was walking around. It's not the most amazing quality ever, but we can definitely work with it. We're gonna start things off with Photoshop. Let's create a new document and give it a 2048 by 2048 resolution. This step can be done in Sampler too, but I prefer Photoshop's tools. So we'll stick with Photoshop for this step. I'm gonna drag the photo into the new document and then it's just a matter of finding the area we like most. Since we want to create a tileable version of this image, we need to crop all the unnecessary bits. So in the Crop tool, we need to make sure that the Delete Crop Pixels option is enabled. Perfect. Now we can start creating the tileable version. Let's go to Filter, Other, and then Offset. Since this is a 2048 by 2048 pixel image, the offset needs to be half that. So it should be 1024 by 1024. If we had a 4096 by 4096 pixel image, we would have to go with 2048 by 2048. You get the point. Now that our image is tiled, there are a lot of areas that need fixing. We basically want to make this cross in the middle of the image disappear. And to do that, we'll use the stamp tool and the spot healing brush. If we want to keep things in an editable state, we can create a new empty layer and do all the corrections there. This texture though is easy to fix, so I'm not going to bother with that extra step, but it's good practice to keep everything as editable as possible. The majority of the adjustments can be done with the spot healing brush. And what we need to do is create all the missing areas of the different stones. So instead of trying to draw the missing bits all at the same time, I'm doing things in chunks. I'm drawing the missing parts of each stone one piece at a time. That way the healing brush has an easier job understanding what it is that we want to do. I'm using the stamp tool only on the areas that might need a little bit more definition. So if the spot healing brush cannot pick the right element, we can go in and select the correct area ourselves. And then we just draw it with this stamp tool. So after a minute or two, we have a tileable image. I'm not too concerned about the unevenness and the lighting because that's something we can fix in Sampler. In Photoshop, we only have to worry about the tiling. If you want to, you can spend a lot of time in this step, making all the transitions to the different surfaces extra clean and crisp. But for the purposes of this video, this is good enough. But let's double check to make sure that the tiling is correct. So let's go to Filter, Offset, and let's do again 1024 by 1024. And everything looks correct. Awesome. So let's save the image and let's move things to Sampler. 
create a new project, and drag and drop the image into the viewport. And that's when we'll get a pop-up asking us what we want to do with a file. We want the first option. This one uses machine learning to recognize shapes and forms in order to generate all the different maps, normal, roughness, etc. Sampler had this option for quite a long time, but just a few weeks ago they released a new version that is even better in recognizing different surfaces. After a few seconds, Sampler will spit out a new material complete with all the maps. Of course, that's not the final result. We can improve on it and adjust it quite a bit, but as you can see, we already have a good starting point. The texture has no shadows or extreme highlights, and that's because the software managed to create a diffuse version of our photo. And of course, along with it, we have an automatically generated copy of all maps, normal, roughness, etc. In the image to material layer, we have a lot of different AI models to choose from. Sampler picked ground here, but we can also choose something else. We have leather, metal, paint, paper, and a ton of other options. There's also stone, but just because this fits the subject matter, it doesn't mean that we have to go with that. Usually I go through the different options and then I pick what looks best. For now, let's go with the ground option. All the edits to the material happen in layers, so it's easy to adjust things after the fact. We can even disable layers completely, so everything stays in a parametric state, which comes in handy. In the image to material layer, we have quite a few more controls. These help us adjust the overall look of the material. The main thing I want to change here is the height of the stones. Currently, they look like they're all on the same level, and the actual real-world wall had a lot more variants. If we adjust the large details option and increase it to 1, we automatically get the effect we're after. The other thing we should adjust is the ambient occlusion, just to give some more depth to the gaps between the stones. I think something around 0.7 to 0.8 will do. I'm not super fond of how the normal map looks, so let's adjust that a little bit. Some of these surface details feel a bit too aggressive, so in order to tone things down a little bit, we'll mix the height map with the normal map. If we go to the height map, you will notice how subtle everything looks. So in order to mix the two channels, we'll use the height to normal layer. As expected, now everything looks faded. If we go to the normal map, we can see what happened. The normal map is now as blurry and as subtle as the height map. Let's first increase the intensity of the height map a tiny bit. And now let's bring in some of the old normals back. If we increase the bottom normal intensity, we'll start mixing in the old normals. And as you can see, the normal map updates dynamically. Now, if we enable and disable the layer, we can go back and forth between the old normal map and the new one. I prefer the subtlety of the new one, but we don't have to decide now. That's the beauty of a system like this one. If at some point we change our minds, we can easily adjust things without much hassle. A good way to evaluate how the material looks is by moving the light around, and we can do that by holding down shift and clicking the right mouse button. And I think we're good for now. The last thing I want to do with this material is add a little bit of dirt, just to accentuate the gaps between the stones a little bit more. Let's bring in the dirt layer and make sure that the cavity option is enabled. That will limit the effect to the cavities only. And then we'll just play around with the quantity value. And maybe with the volume a tiny bit. But yeah, that's the gist of it. Sampler is a really simple program, and that's exactly why it's so powerful. With just a few clicks and with minimum effort, we can get some really good looking materials. Let me now show you a couple more materials I created just so you can get an idea of the type of adjustments we can do. This one has a few more layers compared to the stone wall. There's an equalized layer, which helps with any bright and dark areas in our photo. By applying that, we get rid of these extremes, so we have a nice, diffuse result. Next up is the dirt layer. 
I use this one to break up the overall surface. I want to give it a little bit more variance. And now that I go back and forth between the two different states, I think I like the non-dirt version a little bit more. The next layer is a saturation layer, just to bring in a little bit more color to all the different surfaces. And finally, we have this color replace layer. I use this one just to widen the gaps between the bricks. Here I picked a grayish color, but we can choose whatever color we want. It's incredible how easily we can adjust things and fine tune them to our liking. And I think a dark color works well too. The final example I want to show you is this pavement material. Again, nothing really different than the other two examples, with the exception of the paint warp layer and the sand layer. The warp layer was used to slightly straighten the tiles, but what I want to focus on is the sand material. This is a cool thing with Sampler. We can also mix two materials together. The sand material is a pre-made material in Sampler's library, and I mixed it with my own to break up the evenness of the whole texture. And since everything is parametric, we can easily add or reduce the effect. All of these materials were made in a matter of minutes. It's that easy. The last part in the process is exporting the maps to use in our software of choice. We can export it as a substance material, which helps if we want to further adjust things in Designer, but the regular texture map exporting happens in the same dialog. And then all we have to do is add the maps to a Redshift material and we're good to go. And that's it! If you don't want to use Sampler, there are a ton of other applications that do the same thing. Quixel Mixer, for example, is another good alternative. So experiment with all the different applications out there and see what fits your workflow best. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. And I think that's about it for this video. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.